Awesome. And we are going to be continuing on with our sermon series that Tito started for us last week. Um, Our theme for the year, just in case you don't remember, where can we locate the theme for the year? Everyone point. Yes. Okay, right here. Mas profundo, deeper, is what we've been thinking about this year. We've been thinking about it growing deeper. We've been thinking about connecting deeper. And last week, with Tito's sermon, we began thinking about how we are serving deeper. How do we actually get to a point, instead of just growing and instead of just um, connecting, how about serving? And part of that has to do with us realizing some of the important things about our own humanity Like the things that make us human are the places that we've been given to actually serve, to actually kind of live into those spaces. And as Tito and I were talking about this idea, we were thinking a couple of questions. For instance, what are are some of our needs? What are some of the things that we as human beings need? And what are our struggles? (laughs) It's good to serve people in places that they actually need serving (laughs) instead of just like thinking upon people and going, oh, you definitely. How do we see some of those needs? And where do we fit in the greater idea of God's work in serving the world around us? Where do we fit in that? And of all places, that ended up leading us to Ecclesiastes (laughs) of all places, which Tito and I are finding is we're enjoying that immensely. I don't know if a book that is known for the theme of meaningless, meaningless, how that kind of helps encourage us in different things, but what it does is it gets to the grittiness of our humanity and helps us think about that in the scope of what God is doing around us, but also in some limitations that we naturally have in that place. Now, A side note, if you were not here last week and then did not follow up by watching the sermon online last week, you need to go back and listen to it. It was an amazing sermon thinking about this introduction into Ecclesiastes. And I cannot touch on everything. Go back, listen to Tito preach from last week. Um, But a couple of things that I want to note just because it plays into the sermon for today as well. And that's this. We were introduced to the person who is the first person voice, the the one who seems to be speaking in the book of Ecclesiastes. This person is called Koheleth. Koheleth. We're going to try that again one more time. Everybody together. Koheleth. Koheleth. Hell. Uh, No, wait. (laughs) That's the emphasis in the word, not the only part of it, okay? Koheleth. That's how we say that. And interesting enough, during the week when I was studying for this, one of the things I found out is that this is one of the few names in Scripture that when translated into English, and I found the same being true in Spanish, is always translated into what the word means instead of the name itself. Does that seem kind of interesting? Why? I did a little background on that. It doesn't actually play into the sermon, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But if you are curious about why that is, there's probably a reason. But Koheleth is actually this person who we see these ideas um, through. And we are going to call this person that name Um, Even though in your reading and as we read, you will see teacher or preacher even recorded there as far as an assembler of people. This whole idea of Koheleth is that idea. The other word I want to talk to you about just for a moment is meaningless. Ooh, this is going to stretch back. Does anyone besides Tito remember from last week the word that's kind of translated into meaningless in scripture, what image or what kind of idea does that come from? Smoke (laughs) or vapor or mist. It's this idea of something that lasts 
for a moment. It's something tangible. That, little, that last, you can see it, or like wind when it's blowing through the trees, but it doesn't last. It's not there forever. It's not a constant. It comes and goes. It fades. It's like a vapor. And I will be talking about that a little bit today here too, but that was introduced last week, and I want to make sure that we know that. So today's topic is wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom are a very important part of life. Anyone? Can I get an amen? Knowledge and wisdom? Okay. As someone who was a former elementary school teacher, your entire job is trying to teach people different things so that they have understanding and can grow in wisdom. As a parent, or as a wife of a teacher and a parent of many children who you hope continue to grow in wisdom and knowledge and stature, just as Jesus did, you hope for these kind of things. As a preacher, part of our jobs is to take things that we know and understand, that we've studied scripture, we've spent some time deeply in that, looked at other resources, to be able to share with people knowledge, hopefully growing into understanding. So when we propose the idea that knowledge and understanding is meaningless, you can see why it might have been a difficult sermon to, get to work through in this week. One of the things that I did find out, though, is that the Koheleth never says, actually, that wisdom and knowledge are meaningless, but he does say some things around that that are these vapors or these mists. So we're going to take a look at that this morning and also hopefully ourselves grow in a little wisdom and knowledge um, in what Koheleth has to say and also how Jesus fits into that. So our reading for today starts then in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. So if you have your scriptures with you and stuff and want to go ahead, um, we'll be starting at verse 12 in just a minute. We're actually going to be going through four different scripture passages today. We're going to be reading them and just talking about them a little bit about how it connects with this particular theme for today. So let's see what Koheleth has to say about this topic today. Ecclesiastes 1, verses 12 through 18. The word of the Lord from the book that we love. I, Koheleth, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on humankind. I have seen all things that are done under the sun, all of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom <clears throat> and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, here we start in the middle of chapter 1 with the statement that Koheleth was king and proceeds to focus on wisdom throughout most of their writing here. <clears throat> Tito mentioned last week that many scholars do not actually think that Solomon was the person who actually wrote this. There are many places where it is noted that Solomon wrote things in Scripture, and his name is always attached with those. Never in the book of Ecclesiastes is the name of Solomon mentioned. So one of the things here that they're contemplating might be a possibility here is that this is the wisdom of the kings in general, written in first person, like it were actually happening to the person, but also like wisdom gained over years of kingship and that kind of stuff. Solomon could have wrote it, and also not. It 
doesn't matter who wrote it. <laughs> what matters here is the truth here that we can kind of glean and be able to see what that wisdom brings us into. Verse 13 says this. It's the first struggle we see Koheleth having here. Verse 13 says, I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is under the heavens. What a burden God has laid on mankind. Knowledge and wisdom is a heavy burden God has placed upon us. But it is ours to bear. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Knowledge and wisdom is a heavy burden God has placed upon us, but it is ours to bear. It's the first point of Koheleth in this seeming wondering about wisdom and knowledge as this person is exploring it. We are not called to be ignorant. <laughs> we are not called to be unwise. We are called to wisdom and we are called to knowledge even when that wisdom and knowledge causes a burden upon us. It is important to know the place and the time in which we are and it is our opportunity and responsibility to seek out the questions and answers around it. I find it interesting that here and every other time, the 25 times wisdom is mentioned in the book of Ecclesiastes, it is never stated wisdom or knowledge is meaningless. That is never stated. Something like this is stated. If we look down at verse 14, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It's this general understanding <laughs> that all the things that we try to achieve or try to make a name for ourselves or any of those other kinds of things are like a vapor. They're like a pause in the greater scheme of all of time before us and after us. All the things done, not all the things known here. It does not say all the things known are meaningless. It says all the things done. It seems Koheleth is focused on the actions surrounding what we do to either gain wisdom or knowledge or to use that wisdom or knowledge, but not the wisdom and knowledge itself. What Koheleth does say about wisdom and knowledge is found in verse 18 then, and that says this. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Think about that for a second. Has anyone actually found that kind of thing to be true? <laughs> the more you dig into some of the problems and things around us, the more you realize some of those layers have, layers have layers, have layers, have layers, have layers, have layers, and it causes sorrows. Some of the things that we actually spend time learning about, we begin understanding the depth of the difficulties that people have had, or the width of the privilege that some of us have had over things, or the Understanding of from different people's perspectives, this can be seen in many different ways. This might actually be, I wonder, how we feel about some of that learning and knowledge. Does it cause us sorrow? Does it cause us grief sometimes? Could this actually be a litmus test for if we're using our knowledge wisely? or not, <laughs> if it actually impacts our heart, there's probably some more wisdom in there than if it just seems like an issue or something out there, if it actually impacts us. Could those with greater empathy be recognized as actually having more wisdom? We need to ask ourselves that. 
Those who study global warming, for instance, <laughs> grieve deeply our seeming carelessness in society with the time that we have to do something about it. Those who have deep wisdom about large principles like equality or human rights hold the sorrow of so much hurt done to the oppressed. I wonder if that is some of our resistance to growing in wisdom. Why we are not willing to learn more about the struggles of our neighbors or our community or our country. Because it hurts a little bit. Sometimes a lot of it. And I'm here to tell you today that that helps you to know that you are actually getting somewhere in the wisdom and the care and the knowledge about what God is actually doing. You might have heard before, I think it has been attributed to the person who, oh, I'm not going to come up with a name with it, and I didn't write it down. Um, the person who created the organization around children in other countries that you can support, World Vision, World Vision. One of his, one of his statements, uh, as I remember it, is, may our hearts be broken for what breaks yours. Telling God that. <laughs> may our hearts, as your servants here on earth, God, break for what breaks your heart. And it seems like Koheleth seems to be speaking into that a bit in this section. So... As we continue, though, we take a look then at a little bit further along in this. There are, like, almost half of Ecclesiastes is written about wisdom. Matter of fact, there's going to be large gaping sections that when we get to that part of our sermon series, we're going to skip over um, because so much of this book talks about wisdom, but we're just taking one sermon <laughs> to talk about it. So I also want us to take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. So if you're scrolling or looking um, at scripture here, I want you to take a look at chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. And see what else Koheleth talks about when thinking about wisdom and knowledge. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, the word of the Lord from the book that we love. Koheleth says, Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their heads while fools walk around in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless, like a vapor here today and gone tomorrow. For the wise like the fool will not long be remembered. For the days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. This is the word of the Lord. That was not very enthusiastic, everyone. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Even if it is vapor and breath, Koheleth can see that there is something about wisdom that is actually better than folly. Like light versus darkness. They're both the same. God created light and darkness on the same day, right? There was light and there was darkness and it was morn or evening and morning on the first day, right? Light and darkness is these alternating halves. And what this writer, what Koheleth is saying is this similarity then also between those who are wise and those who are foolish. There are some certain things. And there's a warning Koheleth mentions in verse 14. He says this at the end of that verse. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Who here is a human being? 
No aliens among us again today. Good job, everyone. Okay, so who here is a human being? We are human beings. As human beings, there are certain things that are absolutely true about every single one of us, whether we have wisdom or we are foolishness, whether we follow wisdom and knowledge or if we follow folly. What are some of those things? I'm thinking you can guess what some of those things are. What are they? What, what? What? Get old. Okay, yes, old, old. Okay, we're getting old. (laughs) Hey, like that. (laughs) My hearing, not as good, you know, as what it was at one point. Okay, so getting old and even more than that, we're going to die. Nice job, Harry. Okay, so we are, there is nothing you and I can do that one day that fate will not be our own. It's just, it's the truth about the greater sense of all of these things. The other one Koheleth points out is oblivion. Did you notice that? Like you, my friend, no matter how amazing you are to those who come behind you, no matter what history books are written, no matter what kind of things go on, you too will probably not be remembered by many, if anyone. Oh, that, and this ends the word of the Lord. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Okay, so what is that, what is the importance of that reality for us? What does that help us in our wisdom and knowledge to be able to hold on to? Kohelis seems to be pointing out that no matter what we do, we must remember that we are here for a moment, and that moment is all that we have. These moments, these breaths. If I might have been writing this, I might have also added in this wisdom here that uh, he stopped short before embracing it, but these moments are fragile and precious. <laughs> and in that, even though we, may, we want to use them well, can we hold on to them? Can any of you not have tomorrow be not tomorrow? No. Okay? It just will be. Time goes. It's the way uh, that God created all things. So for these moments that we have, what here then does Koheleth seem to say to us to be able to bring meaning into the meaningless? What is it? What is good for us to keep in its proper place and in our minds? We're going to move to one final section of Ecclesiastes as our third reading for the day, which is chapter 9, verses 13 through 18. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 13 through 18. This is just one of the places that Koheleth gives a little insight into some things that might be wise for us to choose in all of our choosing. The word of the Lord from the book that we love, Koheleth continues. I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man, poor but wise, And he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words no longer heeded. Two proverbs then after that Kohelet comes up with. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Verse 18. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to say that one more time too, just so that you're all there, okay? So... Koheleth, I'm telling you, is not easily impressed. 
As you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, there is not much that impresses Koheleth. But here is this example given that impresses this teacher and preacher. A simple reading of this yeah, book would demonstrate that. They're in the middle of a war with all minds around seeking a solution against a great siege against a city that was seen by this particular person. A poor wise man uses his wisdom to save the city. If Koheleth's first point is to know wisdom and knowledge are ours to bear, then their second point is wisdom is better than strength. Wisdom is better than strength. In a world today where strength like military might or strong arming someone or the power to overwhelm or silence or financial dominance or any other way that we see power used in some kind of strength way to overcome and overwhelm, this seems a little strange. But each of these strengths, the ones that I just listed, when used in the wrong way, destroy And Koheleth here sees peace, well-being, and good comes from a place of wisdom, not a place where strength dominates. My friends, in this, in this piece of wisdom about wisdom being better than strength, Do not let the bluster of fools draw your attention away from quiet wisdom. I am preaching to myself. (laughs) Lay down your weapons of war. Seek wisdom. Gain knowledge. Do good. No matter what others around you might do. It may not prolong your life or even be remembered, but these moments are each precious. And whatever moments are given, make each one of them a bit more impressive by living into the knowledge and wisdom that is yours that you continue growing into, that you continue connecting around. As Tito mentioned last week, these themes in Ecclesiastes, the ones that we're talking about, about vapors and mist, have actually found their fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. Tito talked about it last week, and Kohelet, doesn't talk about it in Ecclesiastes. Can anyone tell me why Kohelet does not talk about it in Ecclesiastes? What, what? Jesus wasn't born yet, okay? The things that we now know that are now wisdom to us that we hold on to as precious and dear about our wisdom and our knowledge and what God actually wants us to live into life are demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ who was not around when Koheleth wrote down these amazing things of wisdom. Still truth. Anyone still not dying? No, everybody's dying. Anyone still probably going to be remembered forever? Probably not, okay? But yet we know Jesus. So how does that play into this understanding that we have and this living out of these facts, these ideas that Koheleth brings forward, that wisdom and knowledge are ours to bear, and wisdom is better than strength. We're going to take a look at 1 Corinthians, because Paul had a little bit to write about this in his encouragement to the churches of Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 17 and read down through 31. So, and we're going to think about holding these ideas Koheleth has given us here 
into this New Testament kingdom Paul is talking about. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17 through 31. The word of the Lord from the book that we love. For Christ did not send me, this is Paul writing this letter, to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before God. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us the wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. Man, this scripture passage has been taken in a thousand million ways. I have heard it preached in horrific ways saying, Christians, don't learn things. Just believe. Stop listening to the science and other things around you. Just believe. Just believe. That is not what Paul is saying here. Paul is the one who keeps saying different things about this particular thing and this particular thing and how God has created it all and how in that we can see God and God's handiwork at work. This is the same person. So what does Paul mean when he's talking about foolishness or folly? Paul is talking about calling us into the wisdom of God not into the wisdom of mankind. The wisdom of mankind is the way of the world, is, used, is the use of wisdom to kill and maim and conquer and destroy and to gather to oneself power. That is this wisdom in the world. And that is not what we are called to. The wisdom of humans often leads to those things, this grasping for more power or using this wisdom to rule and overcome. Paul here points out that Jesus came to demonstrate that kind of wisdom is actually powerless in the greater scheme of the big plan. The powers of Jesus' day put him to death. 
in their earthly wisdom, they thought, oh, if only we get rid of this guy, right? Then this, this movement, what God is up to in the world, will certainly go away. Foolish, <laughs> foolish, because Jesus rose again. <laughs> Jesus conquered death. The wisdom that we hold on to is the truth that God is working above and below and in all things to prosper them and to grow them, to make them good, and to bring peace around this world. It's talked about again and again and again in Scripture. Matter of fact, I studied for this sermon so long because everything I stopped and looked at, I'm like, oh, that would be a great sermon point. Oh, that would be a great sermon point. Oh, that would be... The Bible is filled with things. Read it. (laughs) Know this amazing wisdom that talks about this peace and this grace and this righteousness and this redemption. This freedom that God gives us to do good in the world. It is not to get away from wisdom that is wise. It is to use wisdom in the way that God intends us to do it. Which is in serving our neighbors. Which is in connecting together. Which is in growing in that wisdom and learning how to love better. That is this wisdom. The call for the Christian is to serve. This is the lowly thing. This is the thing that Jesus did. Wisdom from God is Christ. Christ serving and healing, Christ teaching and loving, Christ dying once so that we all might live, so that we might live and serve and share the same way Jesus did. And this, my friends, is what seems like foolishness to the world. Why would one give of their limited resources, their limited time, their limited everything in this way? God knows that there is life and there is peace and there is even the glimpse of that curtain being opened and breaking through of what God is up to in and around and through us. And that is the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So friends... What do we do from here? Even though this life is truly like a vapor, and it is, we know that. I feel like the older we get, and I know I'm older, but not older, anyway, it feels like the more evident that that is. Can I get an amen now? Yes. This is a vapor, this is a moment And it is actually found in more than what we do. And remember these things from Koheleth, from Paul, and other teachers along your journey. Wisdom is yours to bear. Grow in it. Wisdom is better than strength. (laughs) Connect deeper in that. And finally, the wisdom of God is Jesus' humble, serving way lived out in the world around us. Serve deeper in it. Now let's go do it. Amen. God, (laughs) you bring us wisdom And we are dust in the wind, dear Lord. That is also found in this great book of Ecclesiastes, dear Lord. We are simply yours, created from the earth, brought back to the earth again. And well, you have given us breath in our lungs, dear Lord. May we use it in the wisest of ways, dear Lord. May we also have the knowledge that not only do you call us to that, but you also extend to us the forgiveness that is needed 
when we will get it wrong. Dear Lord, instead of being caught up in the pride of having to be right about our knowledge and our wisdom, oh God, forgive us. Help us to ask those questions. Help us to seek understanding among each other and among our community and out into the world. Help us to know your ways and open our eyes to the breadth and the width and the height of your love at work in creation around us, in each other, and in you, O oh God. In your name, we pray all of these things. All God's people say.